Thousands of Afghans have been scrambling at Kabul airport to flee Afghanistan. And European countries are worried about influxes of people at their borders. So, are they facing a refugee crisis? And what can be done to help those who fled their homes? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Thousands of Afghans have been trying to leave their country after the Taliban takeover. And that's raising concerns about a mass of refugees trying to enter Europe and other countries. The Taliban's leaders have promised amnesty to former Afghan army soldiers, as well as contractors and translators who worked for international forces. Many of them are being evacuated by Western capitals that are taking staff out of Afghanistan. And some governments have offered resettlement plans to thousands of Afghan refugees. But others are not willing to accept them and are calling for tougher border controls. They're concerned about a repetition of the 2015 refugee crisis. By the time being, it's a matter of 10, some thousand people in the airport. But uh, in the days or weeks or months to come, it may be a, a matter of many more people with airport closed, willing to leave the country. And this wave can reach us. But I don't think we have to present the problem as from the security point of view, from the security point of view of us in front of migrants. First, don't call them migrants. They are exile people, people who are flying to save their lives. Turkey is among the countries increasing their border security. It's just finished building a new wall nearly 300 kilometers long on its eastern border with Iran to prevent illegal crossings by people smugglers and mainly Afghan migrants. But some Afghans have already entered. I've come from Afghanistan. The situation in Afghanistan was intense. The Taliban captured the whole country. But there's no work. We were compelled to come here. We've come from Afghanistan and we want to go to Europe. The situation is bad in Afghanistan. The Taliban has come there. They behead people. There is no work in Afghanistan. We're unfortunate, poor and displaced by crossing the borders we reached here. UN aid agencies are warning of a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and have called on the Taliban to allow them unhindered access to civilians. More than 550,000 Afghans have been internally displaced since the beginning of the year. The heads of UN and international aid groups have appealed for more humanitarian funding for the country, warning they're $800 million short of what's needed. All right, let's bring in our guests. Joining us on Skype from Kabul, Bilal Sarwari, an Afghan journalist. From Geneva, Shabi Amantu, UN Refugee Agency spokeswoman. And from Mexico City, Camille Lacoz, a policy analyst at the Migration Policy Institute. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us on Inside Story today. Shabia, let me start with you today. The U, uh, UNHCR has said repeatedly how concerned it is by the unfolding humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. First, I want to ask you, what is the scope of the crisis currently? What does it look like? And also, there are a lot of people who are expressing concerns about a potential refugee crisis, but this is really more of a crisis that concerns internally displaced persons, right? Well, thank you, Mohammed. That is indeed the, the clarification here and what's sort of happening on the ground. Um, since the beginning of the year, we've seen a number of Afghans uh, have been forcibly displaced inside Afghanistan. So from the, from January till the present date, we've seen 550,000 people who've been forced to flee their homes, and they're all across the country, but they remain within Afghanistan. And they actually join another 2.9 million people who have previously been displaced within the country itself. So we are dealing with a massive internal displacement situation inside Afghanistan that requires a crucial humanitarian support. Many of those who have been forced to flee, they need shelter, they need health care, water, sanitation, basic assistance to enable them to, to set up and, and be able to best address their needs while they remain displaced. Um, there is talk uh, and lots of speculation about uh, refugee flows across borders, but to date we've really seen these in a much uh, smaller scale and nothing compared to the magnitude of what's happening inside the country. Bilal, let me ask you, just how dire is the humanitarian situation on the ground in Afghanistan right now? Well, we definitely have a humanitarian crisis in terms of uh, people losing their livelihoods, their crops, their businesses, uh, you know, over the last uh, many months of the fightings. 
people have been displaced uh, in some numbers to Kabul, but it's also the fear and uncertainty that is prevalent among people, especially among those, uh, a generation of Afghans who've been working with, uh, you know, Western countries and international militaries. So when you look at the Hamid Karzai International Airport and you look at the chaos, the tragedy, the heartbreaks, uh, you know, that alone tells you how vulnerable uh, the Afghan people remain in the absence of hope for a better and more peaceful Afghanistan. I was able to confirm that uh, a big number of people are now moving out of Kabul city and going back to their own villages and valleys and districts. These are uh, populations from rural Afghanistan, from the countryside, who had fled the fighting either in the last uh, months or in the last years. So at least there's some hope uh, there. But Afghanistan would need a lot to rebuild, uh, you know, the destroyed uh, and damaged countryside, whether you talk about clearing roadside bombs from major highways or whether you talk about rebuilding uh, the critical infrastructure, you know, mm. bridges, other uh, infrastructure that's vital to everyday life. And I would also add that it is a litmus test for the Taliban to make a transition from a fighting force into governance. We have to really remember the Taliban are no more the shadow government. They control most of Afghanistan. And they have brought in with them thousands of foot-level soldiers who have all known fighting and war in, in Afghanistan's valleys and hamlets in remote parts of the country. And now here they are in Kabul, in a major urban center, a city of six million people with high crime rate, with complicated streets and alleyways. And uh, Afghanistan, you know, is a country where I say, you know, the let's see factor is a must because every other hour, every other day, mm -hmm. things are changing at such a fast pace, uh, events are unfolding, that it is hard to make sense of it uh, easily. Camille, it seems like there is this narrative that is starting to take hold that there will be this mass exodus of Afghan refugees that are trying to get to Europe. And it also seems like there are a lot of European politicians who are really in a panic about this right now. Is there any evidence to support this contention, this idea that you are going to see a mass influx of Afghans to Europe similar to what you saw in 2015? Thanks. I think it's really too early to say, and as reminded the UNHCR representative, what we're seeing now on the ground is, is different. It's primarily the internal displacement. Um, I think we should also remind ourselves that most refugees are likely to seek shelter in the closest country, in Iran, Pakistan, as they have historically. Um, the route to Europe is dangerous, uh, and as we've seen in the past few days, there have been closure, troubles at the border with Turkey, Iran, Pakistan. So. I would be really careful on these figures on crossing. Now it is for sure something that Europeans need to monitor and that they need to prepare for. Um, they need to prepare an adequate response. And I think that's where um, how we manage any potential crisis at European border can be different. Um, and I think we have this experience from 2015, 16 that we've learned from and that we have now national asylum emergencies that have increased border uh, operational capacity. Um, not to say this is perfect, that's far from the case. Uh, reception in particular remains a weak spot in the system, so will need to be addressed. But I think we need, like that's what the discussion should be about. Uh, can we map out all the scenario possible in the next few months? And I think Bilal referred to the uncertainty of this middle class. Um, most, many of them are in their home and they, they're deciding what to do. Uh, and so Europeans should prepare for different things that could happen in the next few months. All right, let's uh, take a step back for a moment to delve into this particular question. Are Afghans really heading to Europe in large numbers? Authorities in Turkey said more than 27,000 Afghan migrants have been intercepted so far this year as they cross the border with Iran. It's a route commonly used to smuggle Afghans to Europe. But only 3,200 are estimated to have crossed EU borders in the first half of this year. That's a decrease of more than 40 percent compared to the previous year. Lithu Lithuania is increasingly being used as a route by Afghan refugees. The government is accusing Belarus of pushing asylum seekers across its border. At least 85 percent of Afghan refugees lived in countries that neighbor Afghanistan, like Iran and Pakistan. 
Shabia, uh, let me ask you, the UNHCR has released a non-return advisory for Afghanistan calling for a bar on forced returns of Afghan nationals. What is the level of concern for those who might be forced to return? What could happen to them? Well, in light of the unfolding uh, humanitarian emergency in the country and the, the protection issues and the concerns uh, that we're seeing, the, the critical thing is that if people are trying to flee in search of safety and protection, uh, borders uh, should remain open to them. They must be able to access, access asylum. And whether that is in uh, neighbouring countries or elsewhere, this is critical. Um, refugees have a, a right to access asylum, to seek safety, to be protected. So this is our overwhelming concern. Uh, but the other issue is that if there are any considerations of uh, returning or forcibly returning Afghan nationals back to Afghanistan, um, we are really urging against that in light of the situation and the protection risks and issues that they could face. And so we have uh, issued this advisory, basically um, asking, requesting, urging that these are suspended, um, at least until the security, human rights and overall situation um, improves. But this is this is one aspect. Um, but the second aspect is also ensuring that we do support the humanitarian response for the people inside Afghanistan, uh, for the people that are forcibly displaced, and that requires support for uh, assistance programs, but also protection support, uh, and that really has to be sustained. So these are our overwhelming concerns for for the situation in the country and for those that are uh, may have needs and may try to leave. Ms. Shabia, let me just follow up with you real quick. Uh, obviously, another concern is going to be unhindered access for the UN, UNHCR, other aid agencies. Are you getting that unhindered access that you need right now? Well, we've been present in Afghanistan for decades, as have many other humanitarian partners, and we've been responding to the needs on the ground. Um, it's the people of Afghanistan, those that have been affected by conflict that are displaced, that do need our, uh, our response and our support. So our commitment um, is to be able to continue that. Um, as of today, we're still there. We are responding. We're working with partners. Um, but obviously, our assistance is predicated on having uh, the guarantees of safety and security for our staff, for our partners, and also the access to local communities. So these are the two uh, key issues. And we are continually engaging and working to ensure that we have that access. Um, but we are there on the ground. Since the beginning of the year, we've been able to do humanitarian assessments for 400,000 people in Afghanistan and also provide assistance to a quarter of a million people. So these programs and our work is ongoing, and that's where our commitment is. Bilal Shabia was talking about the concern for Afghans who might be forced by other countries to return right now to Afghanistan. Let me ask you, how dangerous could it be for Afghans who would be forced to come back to Afghanistan right now? Well, this is one of the dilemmas, isn't it? Like over the last many years, these Western embassies, especially European embassies, would say Kabul was safe, which was simply not true. And until a week or so ago when the situation like really got worse and there was an imminent danger in and around Kabul city, uh, that deportation stopped. I would say Afghanistan is not safe. Afghanistan is not a country where people see hope, uh, future, especially economically. Forget about, you know, the security threats for a minute since what has happened over the last uh, few days, the Taliban have taken over the entire country. And it is that uh, you know, denial on the part of these countries to really recognize the ground situation. At the same time, there was a lot of politics involved in this as well. The Afghan government uh, at the time, uh, you know, under uh, Mr. Ashraf Ghani, uh, continued uh, lashing out these refugees very publicly, saying that they had, uh, you know, broken the social contract, that the situation was good here, and he was, you know, very supportive of such deportations because he thought, that would strengthen his position with his European countries in terms of funding. But the harsh reality, you know, is that if these people do come back, uh, you know, they, A, they don't see any economic future here. B, this is a country where, you know, grievances and revenge and retributions, even at a village district level, you know, could cost your life. So, you know, I'm very sympathetic uh, to people who have left for a better life when the country is simply not safe and the environment is not conducive. And I think the politics of, you know, governments, especially here, really undermine that, that you know, basic human rights for those Afghans, especially 
on very, very vulnerable uh, communities. Camille, I saw you nodding along to some of what Bilal was saying there, uh, so I want to see if you want to jump in. But I also want to ask you, from your vantage point, how are evacuations going for Afghans who worked for European organizations and who had been targeted by, uh, by the Taliban? Yeah, so, so maybe two points on this. Um, the first one is um, the Afghan government had asked um, for moratorium on deportation uh, for three months. Um, and we had uh, this letter on the 5th of August from six EU member states asking the European Commission to engage in discussion with Kabul to continue to uh, continue this, this return. So here, I, I think, as Bila said, it's highly political. Uh, it's been politicized by certain EU member states. And it's been a bit of a concern in terms of whether European government uh, can reach a common front on this question, be it from region to Afghanistan, but also the response to the crisis more broadly. Um, so that's that's for the return. As for the evacuation, so several countries are trying to evacuate Afghan at risk. Um, this involves Afghans who work as translator for European for armed forces, who work for NGOs, for embassies. Um, several countries have almost have also said that um, they would open it to other Afghans at risk of being individually targeted, be they journalists, artists, other activists. Um, but selecting these people has been as pro extremely challenging in the past days. Um, and even the one who get on a list um, to be evacuated face obstacle to go to the airport, given how chaotic the situation is. And then they're the one who are not in Kabul, who are in the provinces, and I'm concerned that these people are not going to be able to be evacuated, at least not in the next week. Yeah, Bilal, you know, um, uh, Camille just mentioned something, a very interesting point, which is the fact that even those who may have been cleared to be evacuated or, or get visas, it's very difficult for many of them to actually get to the city, to get to the airport, correct? I mean, this is, this is very dangerous terrain for them, right? I've been speaking to a number of people here in Kabul and in a few other cities. Uh, this is exactly the concern. Uh, the journey is not, you know, less than 15, 20, 30 minutes from any directions in the city of Kabul, especially these days that you don't have the usual traffic jams. It is the security. It is the Taliban at the checkpoint leading up to the airport. It is the massive crowd of hundreds of people. You know, it's the risk of stampede, for example, killing a, a young daughter for a family. It is the risk of being shot at by the American forces and by a former Afghan intelligence service special uh, forces unit that is now working with the Americans to secure the parameters there. So it is, it is indeed a heartbreaking uh, reality. It's a tragedy. Uh, and I would say, you know, it, it, it is, uh, you know, a chain of events uh, for four or five days, which has continued to result in the death and injury of Afghans, uh, but it's also tortured humanity. You know, Afghan people, their families, the rest of the world is just simply in shock when you see that Afghans are clinging on a U.S. Air Force plane. Uh, two of them fell. I don't know where they managed to hide themselves, but as the plane was taking off, uh, you know, there were objects that were first seen as luggage later on. Eyewitnesses accounts saying, no, actually, hold on. Those were human beings instantly getting killed. I think this mission started at the 11th hour. And to get out 10 to 15,000 American citizens alone to the airport would be a massive challenge, you know. Forget about the generation of Afghans who have been working with the Americans, with European countries. There are different resettlement schemes and plans. This is also Afghanistan's most capable generation. This is the most educated generation. This is the most invested generation of Afghans, you know, who are going to be burying their dreams and aspirations. They're forced to leave. And now this trepidation and fear, although the Taliban have continuously uh, said publicly that they do not uh, engage in retributions and target killings, they've given such assurances. But some human rights activists that I've been speaking to uh, have called for what they say should be a humanitarian corridor, a proper uh, you know, process under which these people can safely be evacuated. And they say that artificial timelines, you know, with this evacuation plan is also sending shockwaves. Because when Afghans hear that in three weeks' time, you know, this will be over in four weeks' time, it scares them. 
they say, what is next? You know, we've been abandoned. We've been betrayed by our allies. And we have been badly, badly let down by our former government when the former president abruptly, you know, fled the country. Mm -hmm. Shabia, um, I've heard you and many of your colleagues on several occasions express deep concern for women and girls in Afghanistan because of the situation and the impact that it has had on them. Let me ask you, what kind of trauma have they faced? Have they been through? What kind of toll is this taking on that population? Well, we've seen this year that the majority of those who've been forced to flee their homes, they are women and children. Uh, we have statistics showing that 80% 80, 80 of those that were displaced in recent weeks, they were women and children. So this is this is a huge humanitarian uh, concern when you have so many, um, especially children, I think they, they comprise perhaps 60% of those uh, um, who have been displaced. And uh, so the real concern is to making sure that we can meet the, their needs. And many of them um, may have health needs that may, that may need to be taken care of, uh, may have uh, gone through traumatic situations or, or have trauma needs that need urgent attention. Um, and then there are obviously all the, the dynamics. Things are, have changed so rapidly. Um, we are trying to keep a track on developments, but obviously our overwhelming concern is for the situation um, of people affected by, by the situation and for women and children, and to make sure that uh, they, they have their, their basic needs met, that they are protected. There are obviously lots of human rights uh, concerns and considerations. So that's why it's really important for humanitarian actors who are on the ground um, to, to stay there, to engage, to advocate for these protections and for these fundamental rights. And that's why um, the evacuations are just one part of the response. Now, we're not involved with those evacuations. They are arrangements that are organized between uh, the governments of the countries concerned um, and the people of Afghanistan, but they are not arrangements that involve us. We are a refugee and humanitarian agency, but we are there and we also have the, the same question that uh, these evacuations are going to benefit a limited number of people, but they can't overshadow um, and they are not a substitute for the rest of the humanitarian response. So that's why it's crucial that we need support for the humanitarian um, situation in the country to respond uh, and to be able to help the Afghans who, who are there and don't have um, the luxury or, or, or the liberty or the opportunity um, to be able to, to seek that protection elsewhere. So that, that's why it's so critical to be able to respond uh, to those needs on the ground. Camille, um, aid agencies, uh, the UN, other groups are trying to raise funds uh, through the international community to help Afghanistan at such a critical time. We know that at this stage, um, they are hundreds of millions of dollars short of where they need to be. Um, let me ask you, when it comes to the humanitarian response going forward, how much support do you expect may come from the EU? I mean, the EU just released a statement today committing uh, to support, um, you know, the humanitarian response in Afghanistan. How much uh, is still, I think, a bit of a question on, on yeah, for, for everyone. Um, but, but, but if I can, I, I would want to complement that because I also think um, as we're planning this humanitarian response, which is obviously the top priority, um, there also need to be some thinking about the more longer term response. Um, and this is something that Chancellor Merkel referred to actually in the past few days that you know, one thing that, um, one mistake that was made maybe in the response to the Syrian crisis was not to provide sufficient support to the country um, hosting the vast majority of Syrian refugees. And we know that people fleeing Afghanistan um, today will not return anytime soon. Um, this is a lesson, you know, from the past um, crisis. This crisis are protect, protracted. Uh, people can stay in exile for decades. And so we need to plan with cities, with national authorities in countries like Pakistan and Iran, mm -hmm. so that these communities that host them, um, that are also vulnerable, can receive this form of, of assistance. And, and I think here, for instance, um, you and I share Pakistan in July was reporting that only half of their you know, humanitarian appeal had been um, addressed. And so that's also something that uh, we need to think about moving forward. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there today. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Bilal Sawari, Shabi Amantu, and Camille Lacaz. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.